Today I want to share with you 10 essential prepper pantry items you want to stock up on now for total preparedness. You may be surprised what these 10 items are and you may have forgotten to stock them. So stay tuned. Hi sweet friends, I'm Mary from marysnest.com and author of the Modern Pioneer Cookbook and welcome to my kitchen. Now the 10 items I'm going to share with you are in no particular order of importance. They're all important. And number one is beeswax. Now you might be thinking that beeswax seems like an odd thing to recommend for your prepper pantry. But it's actually something that comes in very important if you like making home remedies. And it's not always easy to find if you're just running out at the last minute. It's not something that's common at the grocery store. But beeswax is an essential ingredient, especially if you like to make salves. And various herbal salves can be so important to help with healing from minor cuts, bruises, and abrasions. And I have a video where I share with you how to make a whole host of different types of healing salves. And I'll be sure to link to that in the description below, as well as the pinned comment. And anything I mention where I do have a video, I will definitely put, it, put the links in the description and the pinned comment, so be sure to check those. Now I just want to quickly mention, if at any time you want to jump ahead in this video, if I'm covering something that you're already familiar with, be sure to check the description and the pinned comment where I'll have very detailed timestamps. Now beeswax is a great thing to store in a cool dark pantry and specifically in your extended pantry. Now, if the concept of an extended pantry is new to you, it's part of the Four Corners pantry system that if you've been with me for a while, you've heard me talk about before. The Four Corners pantry covers your working pantry. That's a cupboard or a closet in your kitchen where you store non-perishable items that you access on a regular or daily basis. That's the first corner. The second corner is your refrigerator. The third corner is your freezer. And the fourth corner is your extended pantry. Now, speaking of the extended pantry, it has many, I guess you could call them sub pantries underneath the extended pantry umbrella. Within the extended pantry, we have what we often nickname the prepper pantry. And that's a great place to store various non-perishable foods that you buy in bulk or that you get on sale or whatever the case may be, your home canned items, so on and so forth, that you can then use to restock your working pantry when your supplies start to get low. This way you're not running out at the last minute to the grocery store having to pay full price for something or possibly simply finding something out of stock. Also under that umbrella of your extended pantry, you always want to carve out a little space for what I like to refer to as your emergency pantry. And this is basically where you keep a couple of boxes based on your household size of foods that are non-perishable but that can also be easily prepared when you don't have any electricity or clean running water. And I have a whole video where I go into this in great detail and I have lots of uh, downloads for you where I show you what you should be buying and then how to use that food to make two weeks of meals. And I have meal plans for you and everything. It's completely free. There's no email required. It's very easy to download and you can print that out. And again, links will be below. And then as sort of an offshoot of the emergency pantry, you also want to carve out an area that I like to think of as the survival pantry. And that's the area where you put your forever foods. And again, I have videos and checklists for you that you can download all about this. And basically what you're putting in your survival pantry are what I like to call forever foods. They're basically foods that the U.S. Department of Agriculture says never go bad. <laughs> and so those are some very good things to have on hand. And the nice thing is I have put together information for you that doesn't require you to buy any special food, nothing dehydrated, nothing freeze-dried, you know, none of those expensive 
pre-prepared foods. I share with you foods that are considered forever foods that you can easily find at your local grocery store. Then the fourth area of your extended pantry is something that I call the healing pantry. And this is a very good area for you to store your beeswax because the healing pantry is where you want to keep your supplies that you use for making home remedies. And then these home remedies are used to stock your medicinal herbal cabinet or your herbal medicine cabinet. Now I know many of us, when we think of the extended pantry, we just call the whole thing the prepper pantry. And that's why I have that in the title. But know that I really see the extended pantry or the prepper pantry as something more broad than just an area where we store our non-perishable backup foods. And so that's why I kind of like to divide things up for you. And speaking of that area, the healing pantry area of our extended pantry, not only do you want to store your beeswax there, that's also a wonderful area to store what I consider to be two very important herbs. So this is number two. Number two is make sure that you have some dried oregano and dried thyme on hand. And I'll also share one more with you. But first, let's talk about why I recommend, of all of the herbs and spices that are out there, you want to focus on oregano and thyme. Now, can you have lots of other dried herbs? Yes. And do I have videos where I share with you my top 10 favorite herbs, my top five favorite herbs, and so on and so forth? Yes. But if you are really just starting out stocking your healing pantry, and you're wondering what are the best herbs to begin creating that healing pantry or create stocking that healing pantry with, you can never go wrong with oregano and thyme. Oregano, although definitely a culinary herb, is also a very strong herb and has many wonderful properties antimicrobial, antibacterial, antiviral, I mean, anti-inflammatory, the list goes on and on. And you can make a whole host of home remedies with oregano. And if you've got your beeswax and your oregano and a few other things we're gonna talk about, you are really in business. Now, speaking of making home remedies, I highly recommend that you check out of the library or purchase the books by Rosemary Gladstar. You can't go wrong with Rosemary Gladstar. She is really the premier source for making various home remedies using herbs. So you should definitely have her books in your healing pantry as well. Now, if you want to expand on number two and go beyond your oregano and your thyme, Another wonderful herb to keep on hand are bay leaves. And the reason, yes, they're wonderful for culinary purposes, but bay leaves can also help keep pests at bay. <laughs> they're very good for keeping different types of bugs from getting into your very various pantries. So if you're the type of person who likes to take a very natural approach and you prefer not to use uh, various insecticides and so on and so forth, which is, that's sort of the camp I fall in. I like to be as natural as possible. I have had very good luck using bay leaves. And one more bonus herb. If you are able to grow this or you have a source for it, you can never go wrong having a little bit of dried calendula in your healing pantry because it's wonderful for making salves for the skin. And just one more that I'll throw out to you, uh, here in Central Texas where I live, we call it coneflower, but you may know it as echinacea, and it's wonderful for making tonics. Now, before we move on to number three, I just wanna mention that if you're ever looking for a source to buy various dried herbs, be sure to check out farmhouse teas. I absolutely love this small family-owned business. 
and Cian, the owner, is an absolute delight, and she will do everything in her power to provide you with high-quality dried herbs. And she also offers a discount coupon code to my viewers. And again, I will have all of that information in the description. And if you're a fan of taking online classes about herbs, you can't go wrong by checking out the School of Botanical Arts and Sciences that is taught by my friend Heidi, who has extensive uh, knowledge all about herbs. And I think she may have even learned some from Rosemary Gladstar. So I de again, I'll have the links below. And she also offers a discount coupon code for my viewers. So be sure to check out her classes. They're wonderful. And I think that uh, you're going to find that Throughout the year, she offers various free classes so you can get a taste of what it is she's teaching. And I think you're gonna be very impressed. Number three is tallow. And also in that category, under fats, if you can also add olive oil, that's wonderful too. But they serve very different purposes and have very different shelf lives. So I first wanna focus on tallow. Tallow is what is known as rendered suet. And suet is beef fat, but it's a very specific type of beef fat. It's the fat that's around the organs and specifically around the kidney areas of the cow. And the reason why suet is prized as opposed to other beef fat from the cow is that once it's rendered into tallow, it's very hard and it has an incredibly long shelf life at room temperature. And if you have my cookbook, the Modern Pioneer Cookbook, I have a recipe where I go into great detail how to easily render suet into tallow and then how to store it and how to use it. But the great thing about tallow is yes, you can use it for cooking and especially frying and deep frying because it has a very high smoke point. What do we mean by smoke point? We mean the temperature at which we can heat it before it starts smoking. We want to avoid going above the smoke point because that's when you can make your fats, uh, you can turn them into something that's rancid and we always want to avoid that. But tallow has such a nice high smoke point, it's perfect for deep frying. Plus, it's loaded with vitamins uh, and minerals. And so it's a wonderful source of fat that creates high nutrient dense nutrition for us. Plus, tallow can be used to make not only a whole host of various home remedies, it can also be used to make lots of beauty remedies, which I know often as ladies are very interested in. And I have recipes for you in video form, uh, along with print, the printable recipe, where I show you how to make a tallow face cream, as well as a tallow foot cream. And it's wonderful if you want to try to prevent wrinkles or if you have very dry feet. And I've, you've, if you've been with me a while, you know I make the joke that uh, when I talk to people about using tallow on their skin, I say, yes, ladies, we're using beef fat. But I think that it's just a wonderful cream. I've used it for years. I'm 66 years old, and I like to think maybe my skin looks pretty good because of it. Not perfect, <laughs> but pretty good. So tallow is just one of those very versatile uh, fats to have on hand because it can be made for, used, as I said, for cooking, home remedies, and beauty products. Now, also under that number three umbrella, I recommend keeping some extra virgin olive oil on hand. Now, that has a shorter shelf life, and you do want to use up your olive oil relatively quickly, but olive oil is also very nutrient rich. It's very nutrient dense. It's very good for us, and it too can be used in making home remedies. So you, it has a culinary side, uh, you can saute in it, you can use it for salad dressings, and you can also uh, use it when you're making various salves or other types of creams. So if you're not able to find suet and render it into tallow, having olive oil as a backup is a very good fat to keep on hand, especially if you do want to make some various home remedies where you want to make a salve 
or you want to make a healing oil. It's especially good for healing oils because it stays liquid at room temperature. And you can put your various herbs and spices in it, let them steep, strain it, and then you either can have a culinary oil or a healing oil. So there's lots of different things you can do and then you can use that if you, if you used various herbs that you view as healing and you steeped them in your olive oil and now you have your healing oil, you can use that to make various salves. So you can see that these things that I'm sharing with you are very versatile and that's what's so important. And these can easily be things that we forget to stock. And especially in the case of like beeswax and certain dried herbs and the tallow, they're not always easy to find at the last minute. Yes, some of the culinary herbs, you can find them at the grocery store, but often if you may be using those for beyond culinary purposes, you want to make sure that what you've obtained, your beeswax, your herbs, your tallow, that they're very pure sources or potentially organic sources. So this is why you don't want to forget about these things and you want to prepare for total preparedness. Number four, honey, and you want to keep a variety of honeys on hand. It's a good idea to have both pourable honey on hand as well as creamed honeys on hand. Pourable honeys are terrific for using when making any type of dessert or just pouring onto something if you want to top a little ice cream or toast or whatever the case may be. But Having those creamed honeys, especially those like the ones that are high in the tea tree factor, they're often sold under the name of Malaluka honeys, those are very good to help you in the event you feel like a cold coming on or the flu. They have wonderful properties that help boost our immunity. So having both those creamed Malaluka honeys as well as your simple pourable honeys are a fantastic thing to have on hand to be prepared. And sometimes the creamed Malaluka honeys can be a little harder to find than your pourable honeys. So that's why I'm mentioning this because I don't want you to forget about this. And when it comes to the pourable honeys, you do need to be very careful the source at which you're purchasing these. The, the more you can buy something that's local and you know maybe you're getting it from a local bee farmer, all the better. Because as we've read online and in the newspaper, magazines, whatever the case may be, unfortunately some pourable honeys have been adulterated in one way or another, decreasing their nutrition and potentially decreasing their shelf life. Because honeys are forever foods. They don't go bad. They may become crystallized or a change in their viscosity, but they do last forever. They don't go bad. So making sure that you have a good source of pourable honey and a good source of creamed honey can be of great benefit to you. And even if you don't have the Malaluka honey right away, if you've not added that to your pantry yet, having just a general creamed honey, I'm able to buy both a pourable honey and a creamed honey that are from local bees here in the Central Texas area. And I will say that the creamed honey is very nice if sometimes you're just feeling a little under the weather and you just feel like taking a little bit of creamed honey on a spoon, sometimes even just as a treat. And yet you know it's nutritious because it's from a local source. And the more you can find pourable honeys as well as creamed honeys that are in their raw state, that they've not been heated and some of the pollen and the royal jelly and so on and so forth are still intact in the honey, all the better. So look for raw local honey. And if you're blessed to get some that has the honeycomb in it, you've hit the jackpot. The honeycomb is very nutritious and it's often got little bits and bobs in it, so to speak, you know, of the pollen and the various other things that are on the bees uh, when they're creating their beeswax hives. And so that's more nutrition for you. And if it's local, you often hear that if you have allergies and you take a little local honey every day, 
it may help you develop a resistance uh, to the various pollens uh, that create allergies in your area. So that's something to think about. And beeswax can be kind of fun to chew on in place of commercial chewing gum. So I'm just throwing that out there. Number five, dried chickpeas. You may also know them as garbanzo beans or as my Italian mother called them, chichi. So the reason I single out chickpeas to make sure that you have these in your pantry is because they are so versatile. You can soak them overnight, cook them, and simply toss them with some of your olive oil and some of your oregano. That's how I grew up eating them. And they were always in our refrigerator and a wonderful food as a snack even. And I love them. And they're extremely nutrient rich, so you can't go wrong with having chickpeas in your pantry. But they go well beyond soaking and just cooking and turning into the cooked chickpea. You can turn them into hummus. I have a recipe where I show you how to do that. And you can also turn chickpeas into flour. And then the flour can be used to bake with. And chickpea flour makes wonderful flatbreads. And you can bake the flatbreads in a variety of ways because you can make them a little thicker or you can make the batter very thin and also, all, almost create something like a crepe or a tortilla. But the best news is that if you avoid gluten, these are just made from beans. They're gluten-free. And so having chickpeas on hand can be used in a variety of ways that are tasty and when properly prepared, easy to digest. So be sure you've got some chickpeas in your pantry for just an easy snack to have in the fridge tossed with olive oil, to turn into hummus, to turn into flour. And speaking of those flatbreads, they're called Soka, S-O-C-C-A. If you would like me to show you how to make those, be sure to let me know in the comments and I will definitely make a video and create a printable recipe for you over on my website. And also, on a very, in a very simple way, Chickpeas are wonderful to be added to any sort of soup and any sort of soup that calls for beans or that you want to add beans to, especially a good Italian minestrone. Number six, dried mushrooms. Now you can often find dried mushrooms sold in bulk amounts at the big box stores like Costco and Sam's, but you can also dry mushrooms yourself. You can dry them in the oven or in a dehydrator. And the reason that I like to recommend having dried mushrooms on hand is because they're very hearty. They give you that feeling of having some meat in your meal when maybe you don't have meat available to you. And even more important, even your simple little button mushroom, although dried mushrooms come in a huge variety today, but even if it's just your simple button mushroom, the white mushrooms that are very common at the grocery store, they are very nutritious. Now, yes, there's a whole scale of nutrition as to how mushrooms are viewed, you know, in terms of their nutritional value. And some have more nutritional value than others, but they're all nutritious. So even if all you have on hand are the simple dried button mushrooms, they are a wonderful source of nutrition. They can really fill out a meal and give it that meat feeling and that, as we often hear, the umami, that sort of fifth, what is it, the fifth taste flavor. Uh, and it can be pulverized and made into a cream soup. There's a lot that you can do with mushrooms. They can be reconstituted. You can add them into a salad and they can be used to make a gravy. So you can never go wrong when you have dried mushrooms on hand, even your simple white button mushrooms. So be sure to have those in your pantry to be fully prepared. Number seven is simple all-purpose flour. You may know this as plain flour or white flour. And I think many of us do have some of this on hand, which is good, but 
as traditional foods cooks, sometimes we forget to stock this. And so that's why I wanted to make sure to mention it here in this list of what I consider 10 essential prepper pantry items. And the reason I like to recommend having some all-purpose flour on hand is because number one, this is the type of flour that's had all the bran and germ extracted from it. And so it is very shelf stable. It's not going to go rancid on you. And it can play a very valuable role in your kitchen whenever it's time to feed or start making a sourdough starter. Also, as I share with you in my cookbook, whenever you are making whole grain breads, if you've got a little all-purpose flour on hand, or even some bread flour, which is just slightly higher in protein, but has also had the bran and germ removed from it, it can help slightly lighten your loaf. And you're really not losing a lot of nutrition because even our ancestors did this. They did it in slightly a different way. They didn't necessarily have all purpose in bread flour, but they found that if they sifted a little bran and germ out of their flour, out of their freshly milled flour, which we'll talk about in a minute, but if they sifted some of the bran and germ out of their flour and then baked bread, the bread came lighter, was more palatable, and more digestible. So we can recreate that if we have our whole grain flours, and maybe they've already been milled for us, maybe you've bought them in the flour form, and you mix in a little all-purpose or bread flour, it can help just lighten your loaf. But now let's just take a minute to talk about fresh milled flour. If you've been with me a while, you know I love my mock mill, and I'll have information about that below. But I love my mock mill grain mill, and I bought this myself. I did a lot of research, and I decided, okay, I'm going to buy the mock mill. It's affordable, it's a stone grinding mill, and it works beautifully. So if you are keeping whole grain in your pantry, and you want to have an electric food mill on hand, yes, Having a manual food, uh, food mill on hand is fantastic, and I have one, and it's great you know, in a backup or emergency situation, but I do love the convenience of having an electric mill. Now, if you have your whole grain on hand, and then you have your electric grain mill, and you grind your whole grain into freshly milled flour, you can do exactly like our ancestors did. You can get a little baker sifter, they're very affordable. Uh, places like Breadtopia and King Arthur Flour, they sell them online on their sites. You can also find them on Amazon, but to be honest with you, uh, in my own personal experience, I have found the ones sold by Breadtopia and King Arthur flour to be of a higher quality. So I recommend those. And they come in different grades based on how much bran and germ you want to sift out of your flour. But you can put your freshly milled flour right into the sifter. You just shake it over your bowl and your uh, freshly milled flour that's now had a little bit of the bran and germ sifted out of it based on what mesh of sifter you're using will give you something that's very similar to what our ancestors used. Now, this doesn't have as long a shelf life as the white flour or the all-purpose flour, so that's why I recommend always keeping some all-purpose flour on hand. Because if you find yourself in a situation where maybe that's all you're going to have, you can make your sourdough starter and then you can make sourdough bread. And making sourdough bread with all-purpose flour or bread flour is perfectly fine. And I have a very full playlist for you where I show you how to make a sourdough starter and how to make a whole host of sourdough breads. And I'll be sure to share that with you. But another reason you wanna keep all-purpose flour or white flour, plain flour on hand is because you want to use some of that to make something called hardtack, which I also have a video and a printable recipe for you to show you how to make that. And the reason you want to make hardtack is that this is the ultimate survival cracker or cookie in essence, <laughs> whatever way you may think of it. But hardtack literally, and it's kind of funny it's, as the name states, it is hard and it's made with just white flour, 
and water and you can add some salt as well and it basically lasts indefinitely. This is something our ancestors used and would carry either through battle or through long journeys and it just didn't go bad because it was already really in essence stale. Uh, but what's so fun about it is if you're in a situation where you have no crackers and you've made hardtack and you've got it tucked away in your extended pantry you and say you're in a situation where you have no power you can't bake but maybe you stock some of the things that i share in my survival pantry video or my emergency pantry video and you can warm some soup that you you either have home canned or that you have in the can from the grocery store and you can get your hard tack and you can break it it's often just broken with a hammer you can put it into your soup it'll soften up and it'll be extremely comforting so i highly recommend that you make some hard tack get your white flour make some hard tack wrap it well and just put it into your and the reason you're wrapping it well is not necessarily to keep it fresh it's just to keep it from any uh pests and that's where your bay leaves will come in handy but having some hard tack in your uh, extended pantry whether it's in your emergency pantry or your survival pantry uh, can be a real comfort in a difficult situation where you're craving some type of bread product number eight are canned diced tomatoes the diced is the key word there they can be home canned or they can be the ones that you buy from the grocery store. Now, can you stock any type of canned tomato in your pantry and in your extended pantry? Definitely, and you should, you should have a variety. But if you're just getting started or you only wanna have one type of canned tomato, make sure you have diced tomatoes. And the reason is they're incredibly versatile and easy to work with. You can make a sauce very quickly with diced tomatoes, and it can be a chunky sauce or one you whirl in a blender to turn into more of a, a looser sauce, like a typical tomato sauce. Or if you wanna leave it chunky, you can turn it into a marinara sauce, or you can just use it as a topping for whatever you're making, some type of meat, fish, or chicken. You can also use it to create a salsa. You can use it to create homemade salad dressings. You can use it to make various types of chutneys. So there's a lot that you can do with your canned diced tomatoes without a lot of work on your part. Yes, you could have whole canned tomatoes, but you're gonna have to seed them and you're gonna have to chop them. With diced tomatoes, you just open your jar of home canned diced tomatoes, or you just open your can from the grocery store. You pour that into a soup on top of chicken breast that you've sauteed. It, the options are, are endless. Mix them with your reconstituted dry mushrooms and top a dish. Make a soup with them. It's just the versatility of diced tomatoes that you can never go wrong with. And you can buy some that are plain, you can buy them with herbs, you can buy them spiced. There's all kinds of things you can do with them. You can add them to melted cheese and make a delicious queso. So remember when you're going through the grocery store or when you may be harvesting some tomatoes from your garden, or maybe you've gotten a windfall from a neighbor, or maybe you've gotten a good buy at the farmer's market, be sure to make sure be sure to make sure that if you're home canning make some diced tomatoes and if you see them on sale at your grocery store stock up number nine is what i refer to as dried beef this can be a very good thing to have in your extended pantry this is often sold in a jar at your grocery store. And you may find that some brands literally are just dried beef and salt and often don't have many preservatives in them. And the reason that this can come in handy is on a lot of levels. If your budget's been very tight and you may not have a lot of fresh meat, dried beef can be reconstituted and turned into a very popular dish that actually goes back to the depression the great depression and even before that called chip beef on toast it's actually very tasty but it's fallen out of fashion but if you have that dried beef on hand 
you can reconstitute it, and you can create a lot of different meals with that. As I said, the chip beef on toast, which is easy to make. And if that's something you'd like to see, I don't have a video or a printable recipe on that, but I grew up eating that. And if that's something that you'd like to see, let me know in the comments below, and I'll definitely make a video about it. Uh, but as I said, getting back to uh, maybe your budget is really tight and you've not been able to uh, buy a lot of red meat, but you've got that dried beef in your extended pantry. You can break that out and you can create meals with it. As I said, we got the chip beef on stove toast. That's one of the most popular ways to use it, but it can be enjoyed as a snack. It can be reconstituted and used in soups and stews, casseroles. There's so much versatility. It's a little different than jerky because often jerky is more it's a little more easy to eat, and it may, but it may not have as, a long, as long a shelf life, depending on how moist or not moist it is. So that's something to keep in mind. But in your travels, look for dried beef. You will often find it at your local grocery store. It's often high up. It's often on a top shelf, and it may be around some of those old-fashioned uh, potted meats uh, like uh, liverwurst and, and various other spreads that have been turned into something that's shelf stable. And that's not a bad thing to add also as a backup. But I have found that of all of these various, uh, you know, non perishable type meats, yes, you can buy chicken in the can, you can buy different types of fish, you can even sometimes find roast beef in the can, uh, but those can be very costly. But if they, some have come down in price like the canned chicken, and canned fish is always a wonderful nutrient-dense food to keep on hand. Uh, but we've spent a lot of time talking about those in the past, but I've not shared with you my experiences with dried beef. And so that's why I wanted to talk to you about that today, because it is very reasonable. It is usually pretty easy to find at most grocery stores, as I said, on the, ch on the top shelf, uh, along with those potted meats that if you've not tried those, those might be something to consider as well. But remember, at least keep a jar or two of dried beef on hand and you will find that at some point it will come in pretty handy and it basically for the most part yes do foods degrade over time and lose a bit of nutrition yes but for the most part that's not going to go bad anytime soon so add a few jars of that to your pantry now number 10 is salt now do most of us have salt on hand yes but I want to talk about a particular type of salt that we definitely should be keeping in our extended pantry. As traditional foods cooks, I think a lot of us have sea salt on hand because we like to use that for our fermentation. And if we're home canners, we may also have canning and pickling salt on hand. But do we have salt with iodine on hand? iodized salt. Now, that's something that not all of us always keep on hand because we tend to rely more on our sea salts or our canning and pickling salts. But having some iodized salt on hand can be very important, especially in emergency situations. If for any reason we are not able to get foods that are high in iodine, which are usually foods that are things like fish, then having some salt that, ha that is iodized can be very helpful for us to include in our meals to protect our thyroid. If you know a little bit about history here specifically in the United States, the reason that salt has been iodized is because people who lived in the middle part of our country, and this is going back over a hundred years, who were not able to get fish were developing something known as goiter. It's an enlargement of the thyroid because they didn't have enough iodine in their diet. Now today that's not very common because with the food supply chain and distribution we're able to get a wide variety of foods. And so when you see something like goiter it's extremely rare. But 
in terms of preparedness and just being a prepared home cook, you want to make sure that you do have some foods that contain iodine. Now you can have canned fish, you know me, I always talk to you about kippers and sardines and I have recipes for you using those things. And we love and enjoy those types of small fish that are in the can. But having some iodized salt on hand is always a smart move uh, in the event of an emergency situation. And now keep in mind, salt is a forever food. This is not going bad. And iodized salt, and there's even iodized sea salt today, which is interesting. And you can find this at your grocery store. They're usually, you know, in those round containers that we often see just regular plain old table salt sold in, and it's very affordable. So stocking up a cup on a couple of those, even if you just start with one, because the salt's going to last for a long time uh, in terms of use. Not only its shelf life, which is forever, you're only going to be using a little at a time. So even if you just start with one of those round tubs, that's great too. But keeping some iodized salt in your extended pantry is going to be a very important thing to have on hand and something that sometimes, and that's why I'm sharing it with you here today, we as traditional food cooks can forget to stock. Now, if you want to learn more about stocking your Four Corners pantry, I have a list for you. It's 36 pages long, so maybe you just want to download it onto your computer, but you can certainly print it out. It's called my 36 page essential traditional foods pantry list. And I will have four corners pantry list. And it's, I'll put a link to it in, it's free and I'll put it, a link to it in the description below. I list all the foods you want to think about for putting in your four corners pantry, but I don't just leave you high and dry. It's not just a list. I have links, I show you which part of the Four Corners Pantry the food should be stored in, how to store them, links to videos where I show you how to use those food to make meals, links for printable recipes. It's very self-contained and you're going to find it extremely helpful. So definitely check the description below. Plus, if you want to learn more about just generally stocking your Four Corners Pantry, be sure to check this playlist here because I have very detailed videos on stocking every corner of the Four Corners Pantry, plus lots of free downloads for you with no email required. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.